Hi, my name is James Lee, and today I just want to share my thoughts around racism and inequality here in the United States, specifically the conversations that we've been having about it. So just to give a little context on this whole conversation, uh, I got my MBA at NYU Stern, and a few days ago, a classmate of mine, a really good friend, sent us all you know, in a group chat this podcast episode hosted by one of our old professors, uh, this guy named Scott Galloway, Prof G. He likes to call himself Prof G. But anyways, so he is interviewing our former dean, uh, Peter Henry, and they're both super impressive guys and they're just having a frank conversation about uh, racism and the police brutality and the things that we're seeing in the United States and trying to shed some new light on it in, in their words. This is actually kind of hard for me to talk about because I like these two people so much. You know, like Professor Galloway, he's one of my favorite professors at NYU. This is a guy who's kissed me on the cheek. I mean, that's a different story, but this man has kissed me on the cheek and that was a big deal to me at the time. And Dean Henry, you know, he is a super, super impressive guy, immigrant, minority, coming from nothing, worked his way up, college athlete, super smart, road scholar. In a lot of ways, we looked up to him as more or less the moral compass of our school. You know, I was going in listening to this. I really did enjoy some parts of this podcast, um, and I really appreciated, especially Dean Henry, being super candid, talking about his experiences being an African-American and never going outside without ID, never leaving home without an ID. I thought that was really, really, you know, he's like, I pretty much try to steer clear of law enforcement in an uncontrolled environment because I don't know what they're capable of doing. And so I always have my ID because, you know, who knows, they could just say you look like somebody else who's done some sort of crime and, and boom, you're, you're detained. Worst case scenario, you're, you're dead. So he's like sharing his thoughts, even as a guy who's super impressive, dean of NYU or professor or board of Nike, he still has to deal with these things. So I, I really appreciated that. But in other ways, when I'm listening to their conversation, it also reveals to me how hollow this country is and how you know, much of a bubble a lot of us are still in and how you know, misguided some of these conversations around racism and inequality are. So I'm gonna play a few clips from the podcast and respond to it and hopefully you see what I mean. Let's bust right into it. This is, um, you know, the social unrest uh, gripping our city, gripping the country. It's not a regional thing. It's a national thing. Talk a little bit about the inevitability of this moment and what you think it means to the country. Yeah, I think it really was inevitable, Scott. Um, you know, I couldn't have predicted that this would happen now. In fact, I thought the moment we're seeing right now, we'd see maybe 10 years from now. So I just want to pause. Okay, so this is about two minutes into the podcast. And just to highlight the context, Professor... Uh, Galloway is asking Dean Henry, take a look at this moment. Is it inevitable? You know, and and the fact that he he said that the moment we're seeing right now, he thought he would see it maybe 10 years from now is a really telling sign of something is like off. It's like, why would it be 10 years later? Like, is there any basis behind the 10 years or is it that, you know, like, I think that thinking is like, you know, something's wrong in the background. Like, you know, there's racism. You see it every day. You feel it. Dean Henry, he feels it every day, but it's not affecting him that much. So he thinks, yeah, it's probably down the line. But if you look at the situation, if you look at what we're dealing with right now as a country, we have, we have a pandemic going on that's caused 40 million people to lose their jobs. And on top of that, because in the United States, healthcare is tied to your employment. You have massive numbers of people losing their health insurance during a pandemic. So you have that situation, you have that dynamic, and then you have a $4 trillion bailout package that was passed in Congress within a matter of days. And then you have a $1,200 stimulus check that was doled out one time, and it took a while to do that, and that was it. So people are out of work, they have no money to pay rent, they have no health care. And so they are screwed big time while the people that have money are still living very comfortably in their nice homes, you know, just quarantining, no problem there. It's, it's like a nice little vacation almost for some people. If you look at the social media posts online, I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, we all know that. Then you add cops killing unarmed black people all over the place. I mean, George Floyd, yes, he was one case, but there are so many other cases that we can't even keep straight. There's just so much of this systemic police brutality, specifically disproportionately affecting minorities. You have those two things combined. You have also no hope in this country. Prior to that, you know, prior to the pandemic, you have a snuffing out of the only populous, economically populous candidate running for president in the United States. And so people have literally no hope, no job, no money. They're getting killed. Why would you think this riot or these protests would happen 10 years from now. It seems like right now would be a good time for that. It seems like right now. You know, we're just two minutes into this podcast and I'm not, I'm, just, I'm trying to, I'm trying to stay open-minded. I don't know if these two guys 
that I really like really have a, a true understanding of what's going on here in America. So let's keep going to the next clip here uh, where they talk about voter suppression. For instance, you know, click the last seven elections, I think. The Democrats have won the popular vote the last six out of seven elections. And, you know, for years, people have said, well, you know, the, the, the Republican Party needs to be more competitive, right? The Republican Party needs to reform itself to actually compete to win votes. Mm -hmm. That's one strategy. Another strategy is to actually suppress votes. And it's pretty clear that today's Republican Party has chosen not to compete. Their strategy is to, is to, is to suppress votes because of exactly the conflict that you mentioned. So what Dean Henry is saying here is 100% true. There is so much, there's a lot of voter suppression. I mean, vote, this country is, there's, voter suppression is like written into the history of this country. Like at every turning point, they're finding ways to suppress voters. But my main frustration here is that people on both sides, the Democratic side and the Republican side, they have an unwillingness to critique their own side. So it's like this tribal nature that um, this dynamic that we're all in today is that my team is good, your team is bad, whatever your team is doing is bad, my team is good. And that's more or less the framing around the conversation because if you really look at it, yes, there's voter suppression on the Republican side, but there's also voter suppression on the Democratic side. And you have to look no further than this Democratic presidential primary. Some examples, we have polls closing randomly at the last minute, just shutting down polling locations willy-nilly, so that's going to suppress some voters. You also have extremely long waits at certain polling locations. And this happens especially in low-income areas and on college campuses. And so I don't know if it's a, you know, you can call it a conspiracy or whatever you want to do, but I'm going to say that was not an accident and it disproportionately affected minorities and young people. On top of that, you have New York State canceling their primary because of public safety. But at the same time, you also have Joe Biden as well as party leaders coming out and saying, it is safe to vote. You guys should go out and vote in Wisconsin. And now with the protests, you see that they're in support of these protests. And I think these protests are very important, but you can't keep going back and forth on this public safety for this coronavirus, COVID-19 thing. It doesn't, somebody's lying. There's, there's some shady things happening, including there's the Democratic Party is in cahoots with the mainstream media and propping up a candidate they like and discrediting other candidates they don't like. That is happening and that is a form of voter suppression. I feel like deep down people know it's happening but they don't say anything because you can't say if you if you if you ask let's say you ask this question on TV, you're never going to ask another question on TV ever again. Or if you're in power and you challenge the ruling class, you're done. And I think the point I'm making about voter suppression here segues perfectly into the next clip I'm going to play where they discuss voting, the powers of voting, and why young people don't vote. So let's take a listen to that. Why is it young people don't vote <laughs> in the same proportions as the... I mean, it strikes me, Peter, and tell me if you agree with this, voting has become too powerful, that our elected representatives are overrunning our institutions, our courts, our laws, our constitution, that voting has almost too much power at this point. Wait, one second. Um, what, what are we talking about here? It's become too powerful for who? Like the people voting or the people who are in power? I just legitimately don't know what he's talking about here, what he means voting is too powerful that it's, I don't, it's too powerful. I, I just don't know what he's talking about, but let's, let's keep going. Why do young people, do you think they've just given up? They've just said, okay, democracy doesn't work. I've got to take to the streets. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Clearly, young people don't vote as much as they need to, as, as they should. And because of that, as you, as, as you said, we have kind of a, a set of elected officials that skew towards the preferences of the older um, and skew towards the preferences, frankly, of those who have kind of the most to lose from actually having a more kind of a flattening of the playing field, if you will. I don't, I don't even know if he realized what he just said there. So he's saying that the voting preferences and the policy skew towards those who have the most to lose. So if you think about that statement here, who has the most to lose? The people who have the most to lose have the most to begin with. If you have nothing to begin with, you have nothing to lose. But fundamentally, our electoral system is completely corrupt because it's, there's so much money in politics. In order to run an election, you know how much money you need? It's crazy. It's egregious the amount of money that it takes to run a campaign. And so you have basically elections that are bought you have politicians representing corporations and whoever gave them money. And so people that have good ideas oftentimes get corrupted by money and it just happens. And so you have a, basically a set of elected officials that don't represent any of the constituents at all. They represent the donors. And this is something that I think it's been talked about more 
but not enough. There's a lot of talk about gridlock in politics. They can't get anything done. There's no gridlock. It's only gridlock for things they don't want to do. Because if you look at it, these defense acts or, or these military you know, budget things, they get passed easily, bipartisan, no problem. But Medicare for All, which is preferred by most by the majority of citizens across both parties. No, we don't have enough money for Medicare for all, but we do have enough money to bail out corporations very easily. If you look at just look, I mean, again, look at the coronavirus cares one app, whatever that thing was called immediately within three days, you have this massive bill bailout of major corporations. You have custom legislation written for major industries. Those things don't happen by accident. They are people who have the power to put those things in and then the people get 1200 bucks. There's so many other things they could have done. They could have done a paycheck guarantee, which is basically what they did for the airline. That was a specially custom written legislation for the airline industry where they, the government, um, they're gonna give money to the airlines to keep people on payroll. But that wasn't done for the small business. And in the end, what's gonna happen? The airlines still gonna lay these people off anyways. I mean, they just got their money. They're still gonna lay people off, but they don't give this same guarantee to small businesses. The reason is, Look at who's writing this legislation. It's people in power. They have the most to lose. And so that's fundamentally why young people don't vote because not voting is not always because of apathy because voting is saying that you're complicit in this whole thing. So it's like, I'm not a part of this. The system is totally jacked up. It is totally broken. Like I think Galloway did make the point, is the totally, system totally broken? And the answer is yes, the system is completely broken because if you look at it, what is actually being passed into policy doesn't reflect what the people want. You know, Dean Henry is correct in saying that it does skew towards those people, but it's because of the corruption involved. And I, I just wish that they would say something. Like they have the voices to say, hey, this this is corrupt here. There's, there's some corruption happening here. And they never say it, which is like super, super frustrating and disheartening for me that people who have voices, they're just afraid to use them sometimes. I think this election is even more pivotal than people realize. Because I really think the question on the table in this election, Scott, is, is America going to be we the people? Or are we going to vote for an America that says, no, we can't be we the people because we the people today looks very different than we the people 200 some years ago. And therefore, you know what about the Constitution? As Gilda Radner used to say, just kidding. I think this, once again, I like them. This is before I say I like these two people and I think they're trying their best to understand the situation and trying to dissect the situation. But I just don't think they understand it that well because i believe this election 2020 and 2016 as well was not an election pitting tolerance against bigotry even though that was talked about a lot that's not the underlying reason this election and the last election to me was about the haves versus the have-nots because 40 percent of americans cannot survive a 400 dollars unexpected expense they would go bankrupt or they would have to sell something or, or do something they, they can't there's not four hundred dollars liquid in their bank account and so what what's going to happen so you have in 2016 you have a candidate in trump racist and all saying that we are going to make america great again we're going to have great health care the best health care we're going to have the best trade deals it's everything is going to be we're going to bring jobs back everything is going to be awesome and another side who offers nothing economically at all. It's just saying, yeah, we're going to be super woke. And that's, that's basically the whole thing. What it boils down to is just a lack of understanding of why Trump got elected. It wasn't about tolerance. It wasn't about bigotry. It was just about class. It was a class divide that allowed Trump to be elected. You created under Obama, the conditions after the economic recession of 2008 and 2009, the conditions that disproportionately benefited the people who already had money and the people who are struggling got nothing. And so if you look at it in 2016, man, people's lives were not better than they were in 2008 for the majority. And so they went with a guy that promised them things that just happened. So it's it's about class. It's not about racism and bigotry. Because if you could see today, the, the things I point out is that 100%, 95% of people, even guys like Rush Limbaugh, was like, man, yeah, we gotta, we can't have that happen. We can't have police officers doing that to black people. And this is on the most conservative side. So I think we've made great progress. There's still more progress to go. Don't get me wrong. There's more progress to go, but it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the next step here is that there's a huge class divide that's happening in America. And class, guess what? Class disproportionately affects people of color and minorities. Let me just pause here and play a quick clip uh, about them discussing diversity. 
And then one of the things that really strikes me, Scott, is, you know, and you pointed it out earlier, that's at odds right now with, um, it's just odd, is corporations, and not all corporations, but I think a lot of corporations are actually put, they're not, they're, they're not where they need to be, but they're certainly ahead of our federal government <laughs> in terms okay. of actually understanding the importance of diversity, not as a nice to have, but as a must have, because they know that that affects their performance. One of the things that I'm seeing in the boardroom conversations that, that I'm, I'm, I'm a part of is the realization that if we don't behave authentically, and not just talk authentically, but actually behave authentically by getting our numbers to change, making sure that we're actually really listening to our employees, we won't be able to get those top students coming out of school because they'll go, they'll go elsewhere. It's, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think it's about authenticity, these companies, about making money. Just hear me out. Just go one level deeper. Just ask this somewhat cynical question. Why are companies like Amazon, Nike, sponsoring and donating money towards Black Lives Matter movements? This is a different viewpoint, but I think government created an environment where this is now the prevailing sentiment. If you look back, legislation was passed at the highest level supporting what these protesters wanted back in the 60s. You're talking about desegregation, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act. Those are top-down changes that happened because of protests. So I believe 100% we have to protest things that we don't agree with. But that, that situation, that top-down legislation over a number of generations created an environment that we live in now where it would be absurd to think, oh, black people need their own bathrooms and their own schools and their own drinking fountains or whatnot. It's it's now over the course of a number of years because of this top-down legislation saying, hey, we're not going to tolerate this segregation thing anymore. We're not doing this. We are now, everybody, we're going to go to the same schools or whatnot. And then, I mean, obviously they created other situations where there's rezoning and all that kind of bad stuff. But in general, it's better now because of these legislations that were passed saying, hey, these are... This is what we're gonna do. You don't like it right now, but we're doing it. And so if you relate that to companies, it doesn't take any courage to agree with the prevailing public sentiment, which is that black people matter. That is the prevailing public sentiment. They matter. But it takes a lot of courage to do things that are actually going to harm your business or it's gonna to have to reform your ways. This is happening not only in business, but in the police as well, because what we need right now is actually reform, to reform the police and how they're trained, how people are hired and everything that goes along with it. But with reform comes admittance of guilt that we have done something wrong. And so that's hard to do. So the same with business as well, is that I wouldn't jump so quickly into praising these companies for donating money or, or, or any of this kind of stuff. Just think about this. Would Nike make a change and say, you know what, we're going to produce our shoes here in the United States. You know, it's going to be more expensive, but we're going to employ Americans so that people can have a better lives here in America. Will Amazon ever support unions? By the way, a lot of minorities work in their, in their warehouses as delivery drivers. Will they support unions to make their lives better? That would hurt their bottom line. That is actually the courageous thing to do, not donating money. So the final clip that I want to play here is at the end of the podcast where Professor Galloway asks you know, if Dean Henry has any advice for his listeners. And so let's take a listen to what he said, what advice is given. First of all, I love the question, Scott. Thank you for that. I would say a couple of things. I would say, number one, learn to listen. Learn to really listen. I think men have this desire or this need to somehow feel as though they're powerful and in control. And I think it often gets in the way of being able to really hear what another person is saying to you. So I wish they would go one step deeper in asking the question, who are you listening to? Because if you don't, if you only just listen to your own side, then you're not really gaining that much perspective. You're still like, I came into business school without a business background. I didn't even know what a balance sheet was. So I, I was totally fresh. I came in thinking, oh, we're going to come in. We're going to learn things. We're going to change the world, do all that. But it, it surprised me how quickly in business school, this hive mindset or this hive mentality develops. The part of it could be my fault as well, but like I came into business school, I wrote in my essay that I was going to come in, I was going to business school, learn about business and then come and work in media so I could change the way that people consume media and help inform the public in a better way. That was my reason for going to business school. And guess what? Three weeks in, all of a sudden I was all in on consulting recruiting. It's, it's insane. It's, up until today, I, I don't care. I'm just going to make my own videos and, and just, you know, have 20 people watch it or whatever in that I'm finally back to fulfilling what my commitments are when entering business school. So, so in tying back to, the, to this particular monologue or whatever you wanna call this, 
this diatribe is not me hating on business school. It's it's not me hating on Professor Galloway or Dean Henry because I love all three. I love school. I love my time at NYU. I have so many great friends. Love Professor Galloway. He's brilliant, great business insights. Dean Henry, awesome, awesome good guy. Very, very, just the nicest guy you'll probably ever meet. Doesn't big time people. It's amazing. But it's telling to me how dangerous bubbles are and how pervasive, how big the bubble is and how much it happens, even though, even from people who I believe are trying to get outside that bubble and just how strong and how unpoppable that bubble is. And that, you know, in a 30 minute conversation, they can end up giving such an improper or at the very least a misguided diagnosis of the problems in this country. I thought that was the last point, but that, that wasn't. I, I changed my mind. There's one, one final point that I want to make here is that I'm just a guy that's speaking to the camera. Probably 20 people are going to watch this video. What I'm saying is I don't have a big voice. I am not a professor at NYU. I'm not a dean. I'm not on the board of Nike. I don't have my own TV show. I'm not anywhere near even being half as close as eloquent as Professor Galloway or Dean Henry. I mean, look how many jump cuts I've had to use in this video. It's insane. But my point is people who are in power or have a channel, they have a lot to lose. They have, you know, hear this all the time. People's like, I can't, you know, in, in media or journalism, I can't, I can't print that because man, I'm going to get ostracized. I'm out of here. I, I can't do this. But imagine somebody who has a big voice taking a big step, who, who's willing to risk it all. That is what it's going to take to make actual progress. It's somebody who has a big voice, who has a lot to lose and are willing to lose it all. So in listening to this 30 minute conversation uh, between Professor Galloway and Dean Henry, I just want to say that you know, I would implore them both. If I could speak to them directly, I could. I would implore them both just to not be so safe about their conversations, to really challenge themselves and to be willing to risk what they have so that other people, people that you care about, people that you don't know can have a chance at actual equality. The last thing here, final thing, I promise this is like the last one. <laughs> the last thing I want to say is for people who have made it this far in this video, I don't even know how long this video is, I really appreciate it and thank you so much for listening. My name is James Lee. You're watching this new project, what I'm calling 5149. It's me just talking about things that I'm uncomfortable talking about. The whole point of me uploading these videos into the ether where 20 people are gonna watch it is that I wanna talk, I wanna create an environment where we can have more uncomfortable, I wanna encourage other people to have more uncomfortable conversations. It doesn't have to be me, I don't have to be the savior here. I just wanna encourage people to have more uncomfortable conversations. Um, so I'm going to be uploading more videos here. So if you want to support me, please subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching and I appreciate your time.